we don't attack Putin or Moscow. Uh, we fight on, on our territory. We are defending our villages and cities. We don't have, you know, enough weapon for this. That's why we don't use it any, anywhere. For, for us, that is the deficit. We, we can't spend it. And we didn't attack Putin. We leave it to tribunal. This is my video update from Nicosia, Cyprus on this Thursday, May 4th, I believe. It is May 4th. And let's talk about some news. So I was here yesterday, actually, at this same spot yesterday evening when I finished my second video update talking about the, the drone strike on the Kremlin. And so I thought I would come back here again and do another video. And you may hear the, the fountain noise in the background. I, uh, I will try to to fix that in post-production, but just pretend that you're, you're sitting right here, you're sitting right here next to me, and we're going to talk about what's going on in the news as we enjoy our, our cold coffee with our board, I believe this is called the board, the board uh, ape, ape club or something like that. It's like an NFT, crypto NFT project. Where is my coffee? Society of, hashtag society of derivative apes bringing NFTs to life. I like this cup. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about some news and let's start things off with, uh, with a tragedy, with a, sad, with a sad story and a tragedy that happened yesterday in uh, Serbia. And in Serbia, there was a school shooting which left eight children, I believe eight children, uh, died. One security guard was also killed. And six children and one teacher were wounded when a 13-year-old uh, opened fire in, in a school. And we have uh, three days of mourning in all of Serbia. This was announced by the uh, Serbian government, by the president of Serbia. And this is a, a tragedy, and our thoughts and prayers go out to to the families in uh, in Serbia that are suffering from this tragedy, and to all the people of Serbia. So that was a terrible tragedy that that occurred yesterday in Serbia. So uh, let's let's move on now and talk about a little bit about the drone strike yesterday at uh, the Kremlin. The drones strike because, from what I understand, it was two drones that uh, hit the Kremlin in Moscow. And just take a look at this post from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia yesterday when it was announced what had happened at the Kremlin, and they put out this tweet which says, Last night, the Kiev regime attempted a drone strike against the residence of the president of the Russian Federation at the Kremlin. We consider these actions a premeditated terrorist attack and an assassination attempt targeting the president. A premeditated terrorist attack. It's a pretty, pretty interesting post that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs put out following the drone attack on the Kremlin. And Dmitry Medvedev, he put out this statement, and I quote, after today's terrorist attack, there are no options left other than the physical elimination of Alensky and his clique. He is not even required to sign the act of unconditional surrender. Hitler, as you know, did not sign it either. There's always some successor like Zitz president in reference to Admiral Donitz. 
who was the successor to, uh, to Hitler briefly from the 30th of April to the 23rd of May, 1945. So that is the, the statement from Medvedev, who I would say is now considered a hardliner in the Kremlin. That's what he said following the, the drone strikes. Maria Zaharova, the Kremlin spokeswoman, she posted this on Telegram this morning. She said, for everything that the Kiev regime does, it's Washington, London, and in general, NATO creators and curators are primarily responsible. They destroyed the legitimate government in Ukraine, put adventurers and bandits at the helm, provided them with money and weapons, installed a sense of absolute permissiveness and impunity, provided political cover and military escort. That is a statement from Maria Zaharova. She also said, Maria Zaharova also commented on the U.S. Army base that, uh, that will be worked out on the territory of Finland. I talked about this a couple of days ago, how the U.S. military is working out some sort of deal to... Uh, to create a permanent base in Finland. And Maria Zakharova said that Russia will be forced to take military, technical, and other retaliatory measures if the U.S. Army uses Finnish territory. Now, keep in mind, when the, drone, when the drones hit the Kremlin yesterday, Alensky was in Helsinki. He traveled to Helsinki. He was going to stay for the day, but he decided to stay the night he was going to leave yesterday but he decided to stay a bit longer in helsinki and from helsinki he actually traveled i believe today he traveled to the netherlands where he will be giving a speech to uh to the parliament and the speech will be i'm sorry he will deliver a speech in the hague and the topic of his speech will be No Peace Without Justice. That's going to be the title of his speech. No Peace Without Justice. From what I understand, Alensky flew to Amsterdam on a plane of the government of the Netherlands. So they provided the plane. It was a nighttime flight. He landed in Schiphol Airport with a ton of security. We're talking about mega security as he landed in Amsterdam. So he's going to be speaking to The Hague. Of course, this speech is going, going to be heavy, heavy on the, uh, the ICC arrest warrants for Putin. And uh, this, uh, this trip to the Netherlands comes after he was in Helsinki and after the, the drone strikes on the drone strikes that hit the Kremlin on Russian territory. Now, Alensky, when he was in Finland, he said that, uh, that his government has nothing to do with these drone strikes. Uh, Podoliak, he also came out and said that the Alensky government has nothing to do with these drone strikes. They both said that the Alensky government would never target the Russian president. And uh, they, were, they were very... Actually, Alensky was visibly scared. I think he, he looked frightened as he was uh, talking to the media, saying that he has nothing to do with, uh, with these drone strikes. And, you know, these guys were talking really tough. Just, uh, just a few days ago, they were talking about how they're going to destroy Russia and, and uh, take over Crimea and all of these things. And, and yesterday, Podoliak and Alensky were like, you know, we had nothing to do with this. We would never do such a thing. Don't blame us. We would never do... Do this. Uh, we would never uh, sanction this attack. I mean, they were like, like visibly frightened. At least Alensky, Alensky looked looked nervous when he was uh, denying his government's involvement in this drone strike, or at least his administration, his his clique's involvement in this drone strike. I personally, I personally believe that this was a drone strike that was uh, sanctioned, that was put together by by the SBU and 
and Budanov or Danilov and these, uh, these Intel guys. I think they're the ones that cooked up this drone strike. And I personally believe that this drone strike was, uh, was done by, by various SBU guys located in and around Moscow or somewhere in Russia. That's just my own personal take on it. I could be 100% wrong, but I think these were some saboteurs somewhere in Russia that launched these drones to, uh, to send a message to, to the people of Russia to create a sort of panic, to create a type of humiliation by hitting the Kremlin, something like that. That's just my own personal take. But anyway, let's, uh, let's continue. Let's continue with some more statements about the drone strikes. This one comes from the Russian ambassador to the U.S., Antonov, who said, and I quote, how would the, the Americans react if a drone hit the White House, the Capitol, or the Pentagon? The answer for any politician and even the layman is obvious. The punishment will be harsh and inevitable. Russia will respond to a daring and presumptuous terrorist attack. He will answer when he considers it necessary. He will answer in accordance with the assessments of the threat that Kiev, that, that Kiev has created for the leadership of our country. And that is a good point that the Russian ambassador to the United States brings up. Yeah, this drone strike just may have, may have hit the, the roof, the flagpole, the roof of the, of the building in, uh, in, in the Kremlin, but the, the message is, is there, you know, we're, we're going to hit at your, uh, at your capital. We're going to hit the, the, the structures of government, where the president works, where the president sometimes resides, where government officials work. We're going to hit that, uh, that building with a drone. And, and that's, the, that's the message that, that this uh, drone strike is, is putting out there. And so, you know, when you, when you cross this type of red line and you hit at, at the Kremlin or, or, or if you were to hit at, say, the White House or something like that, you know, this is, this is serious stuff. Even if it was a minor, a minor strike, something that did minor damage, it's still a very, very provocative uh, message and a very provocative action that, uh, that has been taken by the Alensky regime or forces in and around the Alensky regime, the White House. The press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, she said that uh, the U.S. does not encourage Ukraine to strike on the territory of the Russian Federation. This is what she told reporters yesterday during a White House briefing. So the U.S. is, is distancing themselves from this, this drone strike, though I personally, personally believe that there are forces in the collective West. This is just my own personal opinion here. I don't have any, any evidence for this. It's just a hunch. I believe that there are forces in, in the collective West, maybe in the, in the intel agencies, there are some neocon forces in the Biden White House that probably knew what, what these, uh, these intel forces in Ukraine were, were up to or were about to do because they, uh, they like these types of, of narratives, these, these, these scare tactics that create this type of narrative that, that Russia is vulnerable. You see, we can hit the Kremlin with a drone, so that means Russia is vulnerable. Hence, we are winning this conflict against Russia. I think they, they kind of like these, these narratives and these images of drones hitting the, the Kremlin. So I think that there are forces in the collective West that absolutely... Uh, we're, we're on to what was going on with these drone strikes. That's just my own personal belief. So we have a lot of activity taking place in, uh, in Finland, in the Netherlands. I believe there were other countries that uh, sent representatives to meet with Alensky while he was in Helsinki. Keep in mind that Alensky was given permission to travel to Helsinki by the Russian government, at least that's that's my own that's my own uh, belief on that as well. I I would I would imagine that whenever Alensky wants safe passage out of Kiev, that uh, he has to contact 
the Kremlin in order to to assure that nothing's going to happen to him and he can travel to Poland or Germany or in this case Helsinki. So keep in mind that the Russians were well aware that uh, Alensky was going to be traveling to Helsinki. I believe that uh, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, I think they sent representatives to Helsinki as well, and they issued some sort of statement or declaration that they're in, uh, they're in full support of, uh, of the Alensky regime, or, or what did they... I think they issued a statement saying that they're in support of Ukraine entering NATO as well, or, or getting a fast track into the EU, something like that. Anyway, there's a lot of activity going on in, uh, in North Europe, and Alensky is, is kind of traveling around the, the north of Europe, which is, I think this is a first. I mean, Alensky has traveled outside of, uh, of Kiev, at least publicly, that we're aware of. He has traveled outside of of Kiev and visited one country, but then he's always returned back. This is the first time we've seen Alensky. At least, at least I think this is the first time. I think this is the first time we have seen Alensky travel to multiple countries. I could be wrong about that, but he's going to Finland. Now he's going to, uh, to the Netherlands. He's had a lot of representatives from other countries visit him while he was in Helsinki. Sullivan and Mr. Burns, from what I understand, are going to be traveling to Kiev later on in the week. And then Alensky is going to go to Berlin. A lot of activity is taking place. A lot of activity. And something is, something is being cooked up. Something tells me that the collective West is cooking up something. And my hunch tells me that they're creating scenarios or they're planning or plotting something to, to occur to coincide with the, the big counteroffensive, which is either happening or is going to happen next week, and perhaps to coincide with what may be the failure of the counteroffensive. I think there's a lot of nervous people in the collective West who are, who are in discussions right now asking themselves, well, what happens if and when this counteroffensive doesn't deliver the results that we've been, we've been hyping up? What do we do then? And I think they're trying to, to plan out or plot their, their next moves as to, as to what to do when and if the spring counteroffensive turns out to, to either not deliver Crimea, which is the goal that that the Alensky regime has, has set up or, or is, uh, is repelled and defeated by, by the Russian military. I don't know. So that's just my, my hunch on things. So, something is happening because we're seeing a lot of activity from the Alensky regime and from the collective West, and we're going to have Burns and Sullivan traveling to Kiev. At least those are the reports that I've, uh, I've read. Which leads me to this story from Politico. And the title of the story reads, Reports, More Russian Navy Ships Detected Close to Nord Stream Blast. Media Investigation Likely to Reignite Suspicions That Russia Was Behind the Incident. Let me read you some uh, passages from this article. Three Russian Navy ships were detected in waters close to the site of the Nord Stream explosions in the months leading up to the pipeline sabotage. According to media reports, the ships included a research vessel, the Sibiryakov, that is believed to be capable of carrying out underwater surveillance according to an investigation by public broadcasters in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, which focused on ship movements between June and September last year. A Russian tugboat to the SB-123 was also detected along with a third vessel that the report was unable to identify by name. Last week, Danish authorities confirmed the sighting of a Russian Navy vessel, the submarine carrying SS-750, near the Nord Stream pipelines four days before the pipeline blast last September. The three ships identified by the broadcaster's investigation had their transmitters turned off, but their movements were reportedly tracked by a former British naval intelligence officer using open source information and radio communications. 
something is up. Alensky traveling to Finland. He meets with uh, authorities in Finland, in Helsinki. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, they send representatives to Helsinki as well to meet with Alensky. We have Politico running an article saying that, you know what? Authorities in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland are now saying that the Russians were behind the Nord Stream attack. Or, or they're saying that, you know, we've investigated things a little bit, a little bit uh, further, a little bit more closely. And lo and behold, wow, there was uh, some Russian ship activities uh, a couple of days before the, the Nord Stream pipeline attack. What do you know? There were some Russian vessels there, and, and you know, maybe, just maybe, they were the ones behind the pipeline sabotage attack. Something is being cooked up. Something is being cooked up. And then, and then we have the ICC, the Hague, the arrest warrant, and Oletsky's going to go to the Netherlands to give a big speech at the Hague. Actually, I think the speech is today. They're cooking up something, I am telling you. I am telling you, the whole New York Times, um, what, what else? German media, Andromeda, five, five guys, a, a female doctor in a yacht with Gilligan, the skipper, Marianne, Ginger, the professor, the millionaire and his wife. That whole story was a big zero. It got no traction. And everyone was laughing at that, uh, at that explanation of what happened in... Uh, to, to the, to the uh, Nord Stream pipeline. And now they seem to be, they seem to be resurrecting the, the Russia did it narrative again. And something doesn't feel right. All the countries that are now uh, talking about some additional information and research, which claims that Russia was, uh, was behind the, the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage, or, or Russian ships were in, uh, in the area a few days before the pipeline sabotage. All of these countries that are now claiming this in this political article were, were the same countries that were meeting with Zelensky yesterday. Something is being cooked up, I'm telling you guys. Bloomberg put out this article yesterday as well. NATO warns that Russia is mapping the EU-US critical assets. Intelligence chief sees undersea cables as potential targets. Alliance says there is persistent and significant risk. There is a persistent and significant risk. NATO's intelligence chief says that Russia is mapping critical undersea systems and warned of a significant risk that Moscow could target infrastructure in Europe and North America. Quote, there is, a, there is heightened concerns that Russia may target undersea cables and other critical infrastructure in an effort to disrupt Western life and gain leverage against those nations that are providing support to Ukraine. David Kattler, the military alliance's assistant, Secretary General for Intelligence and Security told reporters. So Politico runs a story about how Russia had activity, naval activity, a few days before the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage. And then Bloomberg runs a story citing NATO's Assistant Secretary General for Intelligence and Security that, uh, that Russia is mapping out undersea cables, perhaps for some sort of an attack. <laughs> yeah, they're planning something. They're planning something, and my, my feeling is that they're, they're coming up with scenarios and different schemes to, uh, to counter what is going to probably be a very underwhelming spring counteroffensive. That's just my feeling. Maybe the spring counteroffensive will not be underwhelming. Maybe it will deliver results. 
I don't know, but I'm just throwing stuff out there. Let me know what, what, what you think. Let me know in the comments down below. You know, all of this stuff that's going on is, is not coincidence. Politico running their article, Bloomberg now running an article about Russia, Russia probably targeting undersea cables, Alensky's trip to Helsinki, Denmark, Denmark, Sweden, Norway sending their, representative, their representatives to Helsinki, Helensky's speech at The Hague, the ICC warrants. Alensky's going to be traveling to Berlin soon. Yeah, they're cooking up something. Anyway, let's, uh, let's move on now and let's talk about Joe Bidenopoulos, Greece's favorite son, and what's going on in the United States. But let's start things off with Jerome Powell. And yesterday he gave a speech. He put out a statement saying that the banking system in the United States is sound and resilient. That is what Jerome Powell said yesterday. And two hours after Powell said that the banking system in the United States is sound and resilient, we have reports that the California bank, PacWest, is melting down. It's melting down, and from what I understand, it is now looking for some sort of buyer or a bailout. And we also have reports that another bank, Western Alliance Bank, is also now on the verge of a meltdown. Here's a tweet from Wall Street Silver. The other bank that is down huge after hours is Western Alliance Bank, down 33% right now. So we might have two bank failures on Friday for the FDIC to run auctions on this weekend. J.P. Morgan probably can't bid on these. So who gets them? So J.P. Morgan, they, uh, they swallowed up uh, First Republic a couple of days ago, but now we have two more bank failures, or what looks like two more bank failures. PacWest was down 60% yesterday, and uh, Western Alliance was down 30%. We also have Metropolitan Bank down 20%, Valley National down 15 Home Street down 11 Zion's Bank down 10 Keyport, Keycorp Bank down 8 Citizens Financial down 5 According to this tweet from the Cobol Say letter, they say total market cap lost in the U.S. banking sector, sector just crossed to $2.5 this year. Meanwhile, three hours ago, the Fed said that the system is strong. This can't end well. All right, today, <laughs> the fountain stopped. Boy, I know there's going to be people in the comments section that are going to say, Alex, why are you doing a video next to a fountain? What can I do? What can I do? I wanted to sit here and, and just have a coffee and talk about some news. Now we have some peace and quiet while the fountain has stopped. So let's... Uh, Let's continue with this video. So that was uh, that was the news from the Fed, and all of this is happening while we have this this news about some sort of investigation into Biden or a push for an investigation into Biden. Here's an article from Zero Hedge: Joe Biden engaged in a bribery scheme with a foreign national FBI internal document alleges. President Joe Biden allegedly participated in a criminal scheme to exchange money for policy decisions, according to Senator Chuck Grassley and Representative James Comer, citing an internal FBI document they say contains evidence of an alleged bribery which took place when Biden was vice president. Well, of course Biden was involved in a quid pro quo scheme with a foreign national, with many foreign nationals. Give me a break. We have Biden on video with, uh, what was it, the, the, the Atlantic Council or Project for a New American Century? Anyway, you guys know the video that I'm talking about where Biden talks about uh, the one billion that he's going to withhold from the Poroshenko government unless they fire then-prosecutor Victor Shokin, who was investigating Burisma. And Biden told uh, told Poroshenko, you're not going to get the $1 billion unless you fire this guy. And 
Poroshenko told Biden, you can't do that. Only the president can do that. And Biden was like, uh, call up the president. You're not going to get the billion. And Biden said something like, son of a gun. He then fired the prosecutor and everyone was laughing. Everyone that was listening to Biden was laughing. I mean, we have, <laughs> we have Biden on video saying that he engages in quid, quote, pro, quid, quid, quid pro quos. <laughs> and, uh, and we have Hunter Biden. You know, Hunter Biden sitting on the board of Burisma, Christopher Hines, uh, Carrie's uh, uh, stepson sitting out the, on the board of Charisma, Devin Archer, uh, Pelosi's kid, uh, Mitt Romney's relatives involved in Ukraine. I mean, give me a break. Give me a freaking break. And now they're, they're telling us, oh, we have some some documents, some secret documents that show that Biden was was involved in some sort of quid pro quo. Uh, duh. <laughs> I mean, I think the whole United States, I think, I think everyone knows that Biden was involved in multiple quid pro quos. Give me a break, man. Give me a freaking break. So obviously, someone wants to exert leverage on the Biden White House. I don't know if it's Republicans. I don't know if it's rhinos, neocons. Maybe they don't want Biden to run. Maybe they would like... Biden to escalate more in Ukraine. I don't know. But someone is trying to exert some pressure and some leverage from Biden. Oh, fountain is on. Fountain is off. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what's going on here. Let's read a little bit into this, uh, this Zero Head Hedge article. We have received legally protected and highly Credible, unclassified whistleblower disclosure reads a Wednesday letter addressed to Attorney General Merrick Garland and FBI Director Christopher Wray. It has come to our attention that the Department of Justice and Federal Bureau of Investigation possess an unclassified FD-1023 form that describes an alleged criminal scheme involving then Vice President Biden and a foreign national relating to the exchange of money for policy decisions, it has been alleged that the document includes a precise description of how the alleged criminal scheme was employed as well as its purpose. We believe the FBI possesses an unclassified internal document that includes very serious and detailed allegations implicating the current president of the United States, said Grassley in a joint statement. The information provided by a whistleblower raises concerns that then Vice President Biden allegedly engaged in, bribery, in a bribery scheme with a foreign national. The American people need to know if President Biden sold out the United States of America to make money for himself. Said Comer, I can answer that question for you, Representative Comer and Representative Grassley. The answer is, of course. <laughs> you have him on video. <laughs> you, have it on video. you have him on video saying as much. Biden was the de facto president of Ukraine when, uh, when Obama... Uh, launched his his Maidan revolution and coup of uh, of the Yanukovych government. He put Biden in charge of Ukraine. I mean, you had you had people like Natalie Jeresko, who was a U.S. Uh, a U.S. citizen. She was the finance minister of Ukraine. Uh, of course, <laughs> of course, there was all kinds of kinds of uh, schemes going on. <laughs> Give me a break, man. And that's just Ukraine. That's just Ukraine. There's so many other countries that I could uh, that I could get into, <laughs> countries that I probably don't even know about. Uh, that's just the Biden family. We haven't even talked about like Clinton and the Clinton Foundation and all of their uh, their schemes. What country? What which oligarchs from which country were the number one donors to the Clinton Foundation? Take a wild guess. Which country? It wasn't Saudi Arabia. It was Ukraine. It was Ukraine. And the whole Russia Gate thing and, and all of that that was being that was being pushed by the Ukraine embassy in uh, in Washington D.C. when they were going after Trump. What was her name? Alexandra Chalupa and all of these people that were that were putting out all of the, the fake false information about Trump that was coming from the Ukraine embassy in the United States. They were pushing all kinds of Russia Gate uh, disinfo. Give me a break, man. Anyway, let's see what uh, what information, if any, they uh, they come up with or they reveal. I don't know. All of this uh, palace intrigue tells me that that the uh, that the Pentagon is going to spot a whole lot of balloons in the next few days. <laughs> Look, there's a balloon, everybody. Look, America, there's a balloon. 
Bank meltdown? Look, look, Chinese balloon. Pac, uh, Pac West Bank is melting down? Look, look, there's a balloon. Biden? Biden quid pro quo? Look, look, there's a balloon right there. <laughs> look, America, balloon, balloon, balloon. Forget about Biden quid pro quos. Forget about bank meltdowns. Forget about uh, a spring counteroffensive that, that fails or goes nowhere. <laughs> There's a balloon, a balloon right there. <laughs> Couple that with, uh, with a Russia. Russia blew up the Nord Stream pipeline narrative, or Russia's about to blow up some pipeline narrative. And, and I don't know, maybe they can cook, cook up a really nice, nice distraction as, as the U.S. banking system collapses and... And the U.S. president is is investigated for uh, for scandals and bribery with foreign governments. <laughs> Everyone knows that Hunter Biden he made his millions because he's a he's, he's a very talented artist. <laughs> his paintings are amazing. <laughs> that's how he uh, that's how he bought his his mansions in Beverly Hills <laughs> because he's a really talented uh, artist and an author too as, as well. He's He's an incredible uh, author as well. <laughs> he's a writer. He's an artist. <laughs> he's, a, he's a renaissance man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Give me a break. Give me a break. My only fear is that, uh, my greatest fear is that while all of this stuff happens, when as the, as the banks collapse and as Biden is, uh, is investigated, my fear is that they're going to start some big escalation with Russia in order to to divert attention away from from what's happening in uh, in the U.S. That's my that is my fear, but we'll see. We will see what will happen. Anyway, let's do a quick clown world, and uh, we'll wrap this video up. Let's talk about Air France and uh, and China. According to Bloomberg, Air France wants state support to compete with Chinese carriers. Paris is a popular destination for tourists from China. Hospitality industry is pushing for more tourists from China. But you see, there's a problem for Air France and for KLM and for European carriers. They want the Chinese tourists. Boy, do they want the Chinese tourists. But uh, the Chinese carriers they have an unfair advantage according to European carriers in that the Chinese carriers, they can fly over Russia. And why can the Chinese carriers fly over Russia? And why do the European carriers have to go around Russia? Well, because the boneheads in Brussels, Ursula Vander crazy, in this instance, we could call her for Ursula Vander stupid, she, uh, she decided way, way back in the first weeks of the special military operation, she decided to close off European Union airspace to Russia. So Russia, they retaliated in kind and they closed off their airspace to European carriers, to EU carriers. And that is the reason why EU carriers have to fly under or over Russia and not through Russia and why the Chinese characters have the benefit of flying over Russia, which means that they can take people from China, they can take tourists from China to Europe faster and cheaper than EU carriers. And now EU carriers are complaining and saying that the Chinese carriers have an unfair advantage. Well, tough luck. Tough luck. I suggest that Air France go to, uh, to Brussels HQ and uh, tell Ursula van der Stupid that uh, it was very stupid what she did and that she should open up the airspace of the EU to, uh, to Russian airline uh, carriers and then Russia will open up their airspace to EU carriers. That's the solution to all of this. But we know that Air France is not going to do that. And instead, they are complaining to Macron. Bloomberg says that Air France is pressing the French government to limit Chinese airlines' access 
to the country saying they enjoy an unfair advantage because they can fly over Russian airspace closed to many other carriers. The French arm of Air France KLM wants President Emmanuel Macron to introduce taxes or other measures that would create a similar cost base between Air France and Chinese airlines, according to people familiar with the situation. Quote, we support the ramp up of capacity between France and China, but there needs to be a level playing field. An Air France spokesman said, right now there is a distortion of competition which needs to be taken into account. Yes, the distortion of competition is a distortion that the EU created and that Macron agreed to. Because Ursula van der Stubit, she, she comes up with these ideas to close off EU airspace, but dummy presidents like Macron agree to it. And they go along with it. So Air France, they should really take up this complaint, not only with Macron, but with, uh, with Brussels. And tough luck. Tough luck. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't close off your airspace to Russia and now call for some sort of taxes to Chinese airlines because they have an unfair advantage. Doesn't work like that. And, and if you do impose taxes on Chinese airline carriers, if, if you do impose taxes on China, Chinese businesses, well then, what, China's just going to just sit down and, and accept those taxes? Of course not. They're going to they're gonna do the same to uh, EU carriers and to Air France. So the only solution to this uh, situation for uh, EU airlines is to lobby the European Union and to put pressure on the European Union so that they can open up the airspace to Russia once again. Let's face it, closing down the airspace of the EU to Russian carriers did absolutely nothing. It didn't have any effect on uh, the special military operation, on the conflict in Ukraine. It, it made zero difference, zero. But Ursula thought, she thought that by closing the airspace and banning Russian airlines from entering Europe and closing off Russian tourists from traveling to Europe, she thought that Russians would get out onto the street and they would uh, protest and they would overthrow the Putin government. That's how these people think. That is how they think. These are the crazy ideas that enter their head. And that's what she thought was going to happen. And none of that happened. Russian tourists just, they went elsewhere. They went to Turkey. They went to Thailand. They went to Bali. They went to Dubai. Saudi Arabia is putting together a really nice uh, tourist package for the Russians. Saudi Arabia is going to going to gobble up a lot of Russian tourism. They went to Egypt. It was a stupid idea from incompetent EU leadership. Anyway, that's the clown world. That's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Rockfin, and Telegram. And go to the Duran shop. 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.